Kia ora, and welcome to an episode, this episode of the Niche Cast, where we are the Niche Cache. We are here in honor of Aotearoa Sports. It's what we do, just chat, korero, and think about Aotearoa Sports. It's a bit of everything. Today, got a bit of rugby league with some off-season Kiwi NRL signings of a different variety. Hiram Harris is on the move in the NBL, and everyone knows Hiram Harris is a niche case favorite. Uh, we got cricket, Black Caps played versus uh, Scotland overnight. They had a good win. Plunkett Shield round two's wrapped up. And we have all whites football as well. It's a pretty interesting early November sporting menu there. But we're here to cover it all in honor of Aotearoa Sporting Excellence. Uh, earlier in the week, we recorded the Patreon podcast as well, and that's what we do for our Patreon whānau. So if you do want to support the Niche Cash, join the Patreon whānau, patreon.com forward slash El Niche Cash, E-L Niche Cash, and we do extra podcasts there, and there's just a good karma cycle moving. You're exchanging energy. We're exchanging energy. Everyone benefits. Kia kaha. And we deliver an email Mondays and Fridays, sign up the nichecache.substack.com. You'll get extra written niche cache stuff and the niche cache content straight to your email inbox Monday and Friday evening. It's just a good way to get the niche cache direct to you. We're always writing about Aotearoa Sports, uh, www.thenish-cache.com, wobbly wildcard. Please kickstart the show. We're doing a little football kickoff. You're in the center circle. You need to tap the ball with some mindfulness, and then we can run around chasing a round ball. Yeah, well, um, probably don't need to do too much chasing on this. It's not really a quote that needs a lot of um, uh, tactical breakdown, but this is from Mr what's his title mr the dalai lama i don't know um his holiness the dalai lama is that what they call him uh he says choose to be optimistic it feels better mm. nice and simple it does feel better and you're correct does. that was a um short and sharp concise to the point as we try Just to straighten be... the mix array yeah well, that's like we're trying to deliver out at our sport in the same fashion short sharp well not short but just sharp concise insightful informative and that's where your mindfulness was today and it was also uh hit the heart because i think everyone can just use a use a bit of optimism a bit of good vibes as we always say wild card i have been this time of year is a bit weird because we have a it's like as i said early november so there's a lot of moving parts in the rugby league landscape while some actual sport is happening in other sports like the rugby league off season tends to suck because the headlines are always pretty terrible yeah whether it's like off season dramas or uh, like the player contract stuff because it's not like the nba where there's salaries and you can do the jigsaw puzzle and all that stuff and you can create content and you can dissect the player market really well rugby league doesn't have that so it's just kind of all wishy-washy rumors like you can just literally create a headline and say bang this is going to happen and it gets a lot of traction a lot of play without there being too much like no one knows what nrl salary caps are so how can like, it's just it's it's a very strange but the aussies love it the, you know the sydney media loves it what i'm interested in is the Kiwi NRL juniors. And this week I wrote about um, the Cronulla Sharks. They have recently signed a dude by the name of Salisi Ata'ata, Odahu Leopards Jr., massive unit. And he joins Samisi Sake, who, another massive unit, another Odahu Jr. Uh, but he was already with the Sharks. He's played SG Bourne Jersey Flag. So the news or the thing part of the segment is Ata'ata going to the Sharks. Keep an eye on him. There was also news about a couple juniors that I've written about this year joining the Titans on a training basis this summer. The Titans NRL squad, they were with the Burley Bears and the junior Titans. Isaac Matalevea Booth 
and Baka Sukaheli, both uh, Manurewa juniors. Juniors, good for them. Um, classic New Zealand Warriors stuff here. William Fakatomafe and Dayon Amatuanai. Fakatomafe is another Oruhu junior. Amatuanai is a, I think it's Fiti Tera, which is down in the Manawa too. They played for Redcliffe Dolphins this season. They've been with the Warriors prior to that. They joined the Penrith Panthers. Um, Fakatomafe played under 21s for Redcliffe. Amatuanai played under 18s and maybe under 21s and they were named in the Panthers jersey flag squad just recently so that's great for Kiwi NRL Warriors fans will love that news as well uh, the Melbourne Storm are signing a dude, Sevens dude Will Warbrick. Warbrick this is not a Kiwi NRL junior thing but it is a classic Melbourne Storm thing first of all you go into rugby which they have done for Matt Duffy and Suliasi Vunivalu and many others. Um, the And he is like a massive outside back. Apparently he's 190 centimetres, runs like the wind because he plays sevens. You think about Melbourne Storm wingers, you think about big tall wingers out on the edge that are fast. That's what Will Wildbrook is and he might play in around next year. Like he's a welcome addition to the crew. Um, and then there was also this thing, another interesting thing that you've kind of got to see through. Uh, Xavier Tito Harris was mentioned by the mole. He is a Calston boys. I think he was uh, first 15 this year. He's been in and around junior warriors stuff. Um, and I think he also made like a blues under 18 rugby union team as well. He was mentioned as being in high in demand. And like when these dudes like the mole are saying something like this, it's just because a player agent has said it to them. Same as the NBA where like uh, Woj and Shams, they get their all their information from player agents and club officials. Like the mole just gets his information and he just like, he'll say it. So he has no idea who Xavier Tito Harris is. A player agent, probably part of it. It's just said it to him. So you just got to, because that stuff makes like, that's kind of a big rugby league thing in Australia. The mole says this must be true. It probably is true. He is a good player and he is in demand. Um, but you just got to, you got to know the landscape and know how these things work, where the information comes from. So i um, not sure if you can, anything, if anything there tickled your fancy wildcard. The last bit's pretty interesting because it's like, um, the, the last bit and the first bit, because when you're talking about the way they script up headlines, reminded me of the old, um, you know, the greatest headline writer of them all, Mr. Staff Writers. Um, and then, and you get like, you know, the, that's one of those things that you see a lot of players pushing back on about like the idea of um, why would you make up the story about me? It's not true. You can't even put your name to it. You just got the like generic staff writers um, byline on it. Um, and then also there's a lot of pushback against guys like, you know, the Buzz Rothfield types. Um, and they're quite like, it's, it's true. Like it's quite obviously like a lot of sort of sensationalized kind of things, hyping stuff up. Um, why do rugby league players have a bad reputation in the community? It's um, partly because some rugby league players have done dumb things in the community. It's also because it gets talked about a lot by people like that who you know keep it in the cycle. Um, but like, it's just it's just such a funny dynamic to me that um players will often come out like you know the old instagram story uh um you know whatever you want to call it um rants or, or something um about guys like buzz and mr mr writers um but at the same time like these players all hate guys like that but their agents all are talking to them behind their back constantly feeding them information like <laughs> you're they're paying the agents to represent them and they hate these guys, but then the agents are dealing with them and keeping, they're like actually giving them these scoops and keeping them in business and supplying what they do. Like, it's just a, it's just a strange dynamic that, um, I don't know if that gets talked about a whole lot, but it's, it's definitely there. Well, that's, so two things from that, the, there's a lot of like, uh, Americanization of Australia, yeah. Austra yeah, Australasian yeah. sport. Um, much of that comes from the players and 
So if you're like any sport, if you're a rugby player, rugby union player, and you love the NFL, you know, you're part of it. You love the, um, the rumors, you love the salary cap knowledge, you love the tactics and everything. But the rugby player doesn't necessarily want their rugby covered in that way. Yeah. They don't want journos coming into the change room. They don't want journos knowing the player's salary. So it's a, that's, a, that's a weird dynamic. And then the, the journos in the changing room in America is something when they talk about that, it'll be like, like two journalists talking about, oh, it's still like, it's the way up. This is how you get in is you got to into like the, the concept of interviewing people in the place where they get changed after games and stuff is so weird. Especially then when you get like um, female journalists talking about the, just the weird dynamic it is to be in that like kind of hyper masculine arena. Like it's like, well, just don't go in there. Why don't you interview them when they come back out? Why is this the thing that is done in America? That has never struck me as anything less than completely weird. And like, borderline inappropriate too correct you also also mentioned buzz the old, old buzz um Buzzy, yeah because he he wrote something on the weekend and like obviously i'm the weirdo who's like reading buzz like no one else in new zealand is going to fucking read buzz rothfield but well, you got to yeah, filter it for the yeah, people is the point you know yeah yeah exactly and you got to you got to tune into what's to your environment um he was saying that how like uh, the Warriors are in trouble, how they've had a you know a couple of rough years. They're based in Australia, and people uh, he didn't really say worried or concerned, but he was basically saying that the Warrior Warriors are in a perilous position, and there is like some weird thing where like people are yeah like not i don't think people are worried or concerned but he was implying that the warriors are going downhill yeah obviously peter o'sullivan left as well what i've seen and we'll we'll touch on this later on the podcast because i'll talk about the new zealand rugby league national premiership i've just seen um otago beat canterbury i have seen upper central which is like uh Bay of Plenty and Waikato, they beat Canterbury as well, and they won the national premiership with no Auckland teams. Well, that's what we'll discuss later. But that plus the fact that the Warriors are actually existing across two countries, and then also this Kiwi NRL stuff that I'm covering. I just mentioned the juniors there, and that was like enough for a good five minutes. Let alone all the you know we had 17, 18 debutants this year, 13 the year before. I have a like rugby league in New Zealand is only heading in one direction and the Warriors might not be a part of that. So maybe that's where it's like, you know, they're in perilous position, but as soon as the Warriors come back to New Zealand and there is also this immense Kiwi NRL presence, and then there's some more grassroots stuff happening. I think rugby league in New Zealand is going to be really strong and, if you don't believe that right now, just the fact that the Warriors exist across two cl- two countries is like shows that they are that people want them involved and that there is significant investment there as well to back it. So um, I'm kind of in the in the mangroves here, and I have a very different perspective than Buzz Rothfield on the matter. Um, well, I could name four teams off the top of my head who are in a much worse position than the Warriors, you know. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. and there's like, yeah, let's stop there. Um, <laughs> Hiram Harris Wildcat. He is the latest player to be joining an Australian NBL club. This is significant for us because we love Hiram Harris. Um, if you've seen him play in like the New Zealand Basketball League, just the beast, the monster, rebounds, dirty mahi, shoots three-pointers, gets the, you know, inside buckets as well. Classic New Zealand player um, and someone who is doing, like, he's making moves. He's going to get into the Aussie League as many other Kiwis are. And you also mentioned him on Monday when you were talking about Isaac Davidson with the New Zealand Breakers, implying that the Breakers could easily put home harris in their team or could have if they got their roster building correct um so there's it's i think it's like similar to the warriors here 
where you've got people who are only going to view it from the New Zealand breakers perspective, although I don't think many New Zealand break like basketball fans just love basketball. So it's not exactly New Zealand breakers till I die, but there's kind of a split where it's fantastic Kiwi NBL action. So many Kiwis are playing with Aussie clubs in the Australian NBL. And then you've got the breakers and then we've got the warriors and we've got an ever growing Kiwi NRL crew in Australian clubs. And they're both fantastic. There's no negativity there any way, any shape or form. So just walk us through this home Harris thing. Who's he joining? What about the breakers aspect angle here? Do you find interesting and Actually, what's kind of happening with the NBL? It's been, NBL has been off the radar for a wee bit. I think like a month or so ago, there was like we had a lot more coverage of the big numbers of Kiwis and, with Australian clubs. So just break the NBL stuff down through Hiram Harris here. Yeah, the NBL should have been starting about now. Um... But of course, they pushed it back a little bit to just to align a little bit better with, um, with you know, the fact that different states in Australia have different um, COVID restriction levels and stuff. So it'll, I think the proper season starts in about a month, um, early December. In a week and a half, the NBL Blitz happens, which is like the preseason tournament thing that they do. So that's that when that starts to come on, we'll start to get like proper coverage. Here it comes. It's getting real now. Um, and obviously the breakers just flew out, uh, hitching a ride with the Wellington Phoenix teams on Monday. Arvo um, heard as well that I think Hannah Wilkinson and um, Marissa Vandermeer as well also got on that plane who are both playing at um, a league women's for uh, Melbourne city alongside Rebecca Stott, who lives in Melbourne. So it was already over there. Um, so that's nice of Phoenix just sharing the love everywhere. Um, but yeah, uh, Hiram Harris, DP for the Adelaide 36ers, development player. So it's not a not a full um, contract. It still means that the breakers, if they really want him, could have, you know, they obviously could have offered him better terms because they had a an actual full roster spot to go, um, sitting there waiting to be used. Um, that is, I mean... Yeah, I just want to see um, Hiram Harris playing in the NBL. I think he's a great, exciting player. He plays both ends. He's um, real athletic. He does a lot. Like, he fills the stat sheets up just to, across the board. Um, love watching him play. Big energy. And I, I hope he'll do really well for the 36 Because He had a little bit of a spell with, I think it was Cairns last year. He didn't play a heap. Um, he was more like an injury replacement type Um but it shows like, you know, teams are coming back for him year after year now. So that's uh, that's a good thing. I think he was a he might have been a DP the year before that as well with like Illawarra or something like that. So um, three different teams in three different years. There you go. Uh, he is, I think um, he joins Tane Samuel as a as a development player for the Brisbane Bullets. Uh, Braden Inger for the Cairns Taipans, also DP. And then the Breakers have um, Sam Timmons as a DP. So there's a few of them there. There's still probably. Uh, I'd have to look because I haven't checked in. As you say, like the NBL has been out of the news cycle for, for a couple of weeks. Um, Harris is the first Kiwi signing since um, since Braden Inger, if you don't count Isaac Davidson's contract being upgraded to a to a full roster spot. So I haven't haven't checked in. There's one or two names that I would still like. I'd be interested. I, I don't know if Perth have filled out their um, DP spots yet, but uh, I'm pretty sure old uh, Taylor Brick could get in. I think he's got what, at least one more year of eligibility for that. I'm not sure, but um, like, you know, he hasn't re-signed. He's been there the last couple of years. That means that Perth actually right now do not have a Kiwi on their roster. Uh, neither do Illawarra. No, they don't. And um, the Tasmanian Jack Jumpers, the expansion team for this season, also don't have the Jack Jumpers. is a terrible name Jack for a Jumpers. team. But, Holy cow. You st- uh, like, I was going to make a joke about the Breakers not having any Kiwis, and then you came with the Jack Jumpers, and that, that stole the show. Well, the Jack Jumpers couldn't have, you can't have a Kiwi playing for a team with the Jack Jumpers, can you? So, um, especially the Tasmania, what is Tasmanian Devils would be the obvious one, I would have thought, but whatever. Um, that's probably been taken by every other Tasmanian team, to be fair. So, that brings us up to, I think, 19 players all up. Um, 
Rawi, Fedenovic, Mariahu, Liafa, Tarangi, Smith, Milner, Wetzel, Lowe, Abercrombie, Delaney, Davidson, Simmons, Illy, Prewster, Natai, Kenny, Harrison, Salt, Samuel, Inga, and Harris. That's, that's your full contingent or spread out against different teams. Breakers have got, I think, uh, six or seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, including the DP. Um, obviously, the two Webster brothers were contracted and have left for other things. Um, Corey's in Egypt and Ty has now just signed a pretty amazing deal in, in Lithuania where he's going to play, be playing um, EuroLeague, which is like, that is the, the definition of falling upwards there. I, um, I've seen people like suggesting that maybe he just finessed his way out of the contract because he did get vaccinated to play in Lithuania, according to the, his Lithuanian team. I, I don't think that's more likely he just decided he needed to get a vaccination if he was going to get a good job. And he's got a, he got one where it was like, he, he's moving upwards. That's a, that's a better deal than playing for the breakers. I got to imagine EuroLeague stuff is very good. So didn't he um, replace um, an NBA guy? Yeah. NBA? Emmanuel Moutier, yeah. Um, who, yeah, is not an NBA guy anymore, obviously, but um, it's a weird one. Cause he was their new signing as well. I don't know exactly what the deal was, but they signed him and then something about, I don't know if Moody just didn't want to play for them or changed his mind or something. It sounded like there were sort of reasons where they decided this guy's not committed. So they cut him and replaced him um, with Ty Webster. So that's fantastic. That's, um, that's awesome. Um, but yeah, like if the Webster bros were there, then we'd be at 21 players for the, for the, um, for the upcoming season. I think they got to 20 last year for Kiwis who featured, so assuming all these 19 guys get a go and there's still guys like Brett and a couple others who might pop up. Um, we weren't at this number this time last year because, you know, Tom Vodanovich, for example, joined the Sydney Kings as an injury replacement player. Um, there are a couple others. Uh, Mike Cadena, I think, was another one who did a similar thing. So, you know, there's, there's every scope. Well, the, the during the season bit depends on... Um, depends on being able to travel to Australia during the season for guys to be picked up. But, the, you know, there's definitely, that, that could be the case by the end of things. Um, breakers are certainly hoping to play a lot of home games down the second half of the season. So um, there's every scope that we could get up to 20 and beyond with um, by the course of the season. And then that's good. That's, that's awesome. That's like, it's not, it shows that last year wasn't just an, an outlier with the number of Kiwis that were getting deals. It's actually like this is a sustainable thing that's happening every season now, because it's, you know, we're at a very similar number again, a year later with time still to go. Same exact argument with the NRL, like yep. it, yep. it leap, uh, leapt up, it didn't drop away, you know, just because of a COVID year or whatever it is. So there's like quite clear trends in both competitions and both sports. I'd chuck the A-League women in there as well, where, um, yes, the Phoenix have a team. Yes, that supplies 13 new New Zealanders, which is more than they've ever played in a single season before. But there's also like, um, I haven't got the list in front of me, but I'd say about seven or so players that are signed to Australian clubs at the same time as well. So even if it wasn't for the Phoenix, there would still be something close to a record number of Kiwis playing in that competition this year as well. That's the definition of the niche case right there. Just beautiful stuff, beautiful stuff. If I had to ask you right now, just because you've like refreshed yourself in NBL business, take the breakers out of it. And I just like one player, one name that just intrigues you based off being like, you just like literally refreshed your brain about the Kiwis involved, which player as part of that refreshing process was like, oh, yeah, he's there. Because for me, it was Tane Samuel, but you got Yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, I, don't know. I think maybe Jack Salt. Maybe Jack Salt popping up at the Brisbane Bullets where he will be like in a Kiwi big man tag team with Terrell Harrison, who's been there for a couple of years. Um, that's that's pretty cool. I, um Jack Salt, you know, came up through as a as a breakers dude um, back in the day. Went off, won a national championship in in college with Virginia, um, which is the same school that um, the same school that uh, Joe Bell went to. All whites midfielder Joe Bell went to the same school, and also the same school that um, old uh, what's his name that was a uh, the the DP for um, oh, mind blanking now because I haven't looked at these names for a while. The DP for the Breakers last year. Um, Played for uh, the Huskies in the previous NBL. Um, what's his name? Young fella, guard, real good. Um, he's he's playing for. Uh, I'll remember Tain, it in about two Tain minutes. Samuel Tain Tain Murray uh, Tain Murray Tain Murray. That's yeah. the fella. 
um, yeah, he's he's playing for Virginia this year, his first year of um, college ball. So that's I think that's probably a similar. I think Kirk Penny has some connections there as well. I'm not sure if um, might be a booster. Uh, yeah, he might have helped set things up. I'm not sure what his deal is. If he was maybe like a um, did some coaching there or something like that. I, I, I don't think that's the school he went to, but it might be. I, I don't. I don't know. I wasn't following things close enough back then when um, when Kirk Penny was at college. But interesting, the Virginia Cavaliers, the um, team's called, is interesting, weird, like recurring connection. It's probably not weird at all. It's probably like you know, Tane Murray is going there because Jack Salt went there and probably gave him a good reference and things like that. And because they had a a Kiwi dude who was one of the didn't play big minutes, but was one of their team captains um, when they won a national championship probably a little bit more open to signing further Kiwis and um, down the line as well. So um, especially someone who came up through a, a similar-ish pathway as well. So I'd, I'd imagine that's not a coincidence whatsoever. Like Kirk Penny's definitely handing over bags of cash. You reckon Kirk Penny's got bags of cash? I hope so. Well, he's, yeah, well, he's just like, he'll be part of it. You know, well, you know how those college NCAA stuff work. You know, it's a mutually beneficial relationship. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah. you know, you give bags of cash, but then you probably make oh, there a we go. he's the um he is the current player development manager on the coaching staff with the university of virginia oh, so he doesn't even need to hand over the bags of cash he's accepting the bags of cash probably <laughs> so i think ncaa works isn't it that's the riddle for the day what's kirk penny up to solved it happy um let's just quickly touch on the all-white squad wildcard that was named to play the gambia as we discussed pre-show not um, Gambia, the Gambia. That is like an official tag, the Gambia. So is, I'm really? assu- is that just Gambia? As in what, when people say Gambia, that's what they mean is the Gambia? I, I assume so. I don't think there'd be a the Gambia and also a Gambia, um, but I don't know. The Gambia is a small West African country bounded by Senegal with the narrow Atlantic coastline. It's known for its diverse ecosystems around the central Gambia River. Um, maybe the Gambia River is maybe where it gets the name from. I don't know. Um, but even, even abundant wildlife see- in its Kiang West National Park, blah, blah, blah. Wetlands includes, um, wetland reserve includes monkeys, leopards, hippos, hyenas, and rare birds. The capital, Banjul, and nearby Serekunda offer access to beaches. That's cool. It's a weird looking country. If you look it up, it's shaped like a snake because it just follows the river. So it's got like a, a thin coastline and then it just goes on like this for ages. Um, it's a bit of a strange one. Well, shout out to <laughs> the Gambia. And I just got a, I, I've had this note in my mind for a couple of weeks, Wildcard. Always played Curacao in one in previous game. Mm-hmm. I was watching the, um, the baseball and old mate um, Albies, Aussie Albies. For the, I think the Braves won the the global yeah. global international World Series, and um, Albies I think was on the Braves team. He's from Curacao. Really? Yep. Good and he's job. a gun. Like he's he's a switch. A lot of sort switcher. of Caribbean Central American types play MLB, obviously, but not normally like Curacao. Like is you, there's sort of like a split. Like the Central American is. Um, like Dominican Republics and, and places like that and Cuba and like these guys play baseball and then the sort of what we know is the West Indies play cricket. So like it's a, I, I don't, I didn't know where Curacao would fall on that um, continuum. I guess it's somewhere in between because it's a Dutch colony, but there you go. It's, it's so re- like, that is a, that's a mind bender that one that like all the countries and that's part of the world, they either play baseball or cricket and they love it. And they're, they're not, amazing at it. So yeah, yeah and they're both, really good. both those areas yeah. are far beyond their um, sort of proportions at how good they are at those two. Because you got to you got to think like West Indies is a amalgamation of the West Indies. So Curacao would be part of the West Indies if they play cricket. And then you've got all the great cricketers from all those individual countries. Um, so we got the All Whites versus the. Gambia, the Aotearoa versus the Gambia. And it's in a couple of weeks, but we did have the squad names. So just take us through the squad in terms of like the recent fixtures. Are there any changes from those games coming into these games? I'm assuming taking a look at this, it's the same theory of European base, base players, overseas base players, and there's no local New Zealand players. Um, Boxall's still there. 
Tui Loma is still there. Um, so obviously they played in the last games, right? So yeah, it's just an international. One of the boxers is still forwards. there because um, Nico Boxel's not there. He's he's been injured. Um, he missed about three games in a row uh, after international duty, but they did bring him back for their last game of the season. SJK, the, his club in Finland, is called. It was sort of it was basically a playoff for for third place. Um, it was third versus fourth. Whoever won was going to get that spot. They won five two. Boxel played ninety minutes. But I, I think because it's the last game of their season, it's probably safe to say he wasn't 100%. They just rushed him back because it was the last game. And he probably needs a rest so I can see why. Even if even if not, if you've just one game back from injury, it still sort of makes sense that he wouldn't play the um, uh, all-white stuff or that you wouldn't need to risk him. Um, same deal with Dalton Wilkins, who is back from injury that he sustained just before the all-whites tour. So he didn't actually get to play in the all-whites tour, but he, um, he was named in, this, in the past squad. Um, the Curacao Bahrain squad. He's not here. Um, same reason. Like, he came back. He actually came off the bench and then got sent off in stoppage time. So, um, in his most recent game. So, uh, yeah. Well, uh, they're, they're just not risking with him. And then Nick Sarnev is missing for personal reasons, which is whatever. He's um, the the thing there is like um, Sarnev didn't play at all in the last tour. He was the back. They gave a one game to Stefan Marinovic, one game to Michael Vald. Um, Zainev was the third keeper and didn't play Nico Boxel didn't play the last tour they had an abundance of defenders like probably too many defenders and it's notable that with Nico Boxel not there this time they've replaced him with a striker rather than another centre back which probably is saying that yeah we maybe didn't need the extra um, defender last time um, but he didn't play in that last thing and and Dalton Wilkins obviously was injured so he didn't play in the last tour so the three guys there's three changes from that squad to this squad the three guys who are not there didn't actually get any minutes against Curacao or Bahrain so it's really not a like we're talking about um, changes on the very end of the roster there and yeah no Australian or New Zealand based players um, other than that uh, like which is the same restriction that they had on last squad as well so keeping that in mind is basically the same thing all of the starting 11 type guys are still there um the three guys who have come in jamie searle who's a um 20 year old goalkeeper was with danny hay at the olympics is the backup there to michael vald in that squad he plays for swansea city under 23s um gone pretty well they're working his way up the ranks at at, uh, at a pretty decent club um so that's cool he's he's there as the third stringer for this one i think it's the first time he's been called out for the full national team um same deal is for Francis De Vries, who is in there as the next as the Dalton Wilkins replacing left back. Um, De Vries just had an excellent season for, in fact, it's not even finished for IFK Varnamo in Sweden, where they got promoted. He plays with Joel Stevens as well. He's not in the squad, but is part of you know the teammates at club level. Um, they got promoted from the third tier in Sweden last season. They've just been promoted from the second tier in Sweden this season. So back-to-back -to -back promotions to get them into the top flight for the first time ever in that club's like 100-plus year history. And Francis de Vries scored a goal in the game that secured promotion as well. It was his first goal of the season. So um, sweet as from him. He's got a nice highlights package on his YouTube channel as well. It's been doing some rounds. Um, I chucked it in Flying Kiwis one week, and then I noticed like other <laughs> some of the other sort of football mafia media types, um, my cohorts there chucking out the same clips i don't know if they're just scooping scooping the thing or maybe just because francis de vries um was on the verge of promotion everyone's googling him the same as i was maybe also the case um but looking at that like because i remember watching him quite a bit um i followed him quite a bit while he was in the vancouver system he got drafted out of the usa college play he never played for the vancouver white cats first team but you remember when there was like the vancouver all white caps thing where they had um they had like Stefan Marinovic was there, Declan Wynn was there, Maya Bevan was there, Francis de Vries was there, all four of these guys at once. I think Marinovic is the only one who ever played MLS for that club, but the other three were there playing good games in the um, in the reserve team um, before they moved on to other things. So I followed him a lot there, but I actually got to watch him quite a bit when he played National League for Canterbury um, a year or two ago. And he was like a centre back, um, centre defensive midfielder, good technical player. Um, um, decent enough on both feed and like quite a smart, um, well positioned, uh, you know, good, just a, just a good, tidy player. Um, in Sweden, he's evolved into like a proper left back, um, bursting up and down the wings, swinging in really good crosses, um, quick too. I didn't realize he was as fast as he is. So uh, that's 
probably the main talking point of this squad um, in terms of the players that have been picked. And I think it's a really cool one because it's someone who hasn't really been in the inside group, like in the insiders group for the All Whites before. Um, literally, like, you know, he's not a 19-year-old coming through. He'd be 25 or 26 or something. Um, but he's had a really good season, achieved a lot at club level, um, been in good form, and he's been rewarded for that. So that's the kind of um, selection I really find encouraging to see those kind of guys getting through um, uh, into the, you know, into the all-white setup. That's cool. And then the other guy who's been called up who wasn't there last time, Elliot Collier, who's the opposite. He's had a terrible season at club level playing um, at a you know, relatively decent level for Chicago um, Fire in the MLS, but he doesn't really play. He's played like 33 minutes in the last, I think, two months or something combined. He's on the bench and he's lucky if he gets five minutes at the end, hasn't scored a goal for two years, but um has been a part of Danny Hay, was a part of Danny Hay's first all white squad. So he's a little bit familiar with what he can do there. And, you know, thing with football is sometimes, um, same with a lot of sports, sometimes you're just in a club that doesn't, that maybe is a slight step above where you should be, or maybe it's just like, um, you know, you could deliver if you were given the right chance and the right role, but you just, the fit isn't quite there. The coach sees something different in you or whatever, and you don't get that chance. So, um, there's a few of those guys, I think, in the in the strikers selection. Um, the rest of the team sort of picks itself. But among the forwards, I think there are guys, Andre de Jong, similar, doesn't really play at all for his um, South African team. Um, Joey Champness is still working his way in for his, uh, for his new Turkish team. He did score a goal off the bench a couple of weeks ago, but he, he doesn't play very much for them. He's still sort of building his... Like, yeah, the difference there is that he's early in his time at that club, so he's still sort of like... Trying to get his um, trying to get his foot in the door, but you know, there's three guys there that don't play a lot for club level, haven't really been in great form because of that. Um, however, they're the backups. You know, the the starters are going to be presumably Chris Wood up front, just scored an r- absolute ripper for Burnley on the weekend. Um, Kellen McCowart, Eli Just can't separate those two. They play together every week for Helsingor and Denmark. They basically telepathic. They um, you know, elevate each other's game for playing with each other for the amount of football they've played together. It's like that, and they've been playing great footy all season. So, like, um, it's very. So there's only one game here. There, well, there's two games, but the first game is going to be a non, like a sort of friendly, non-official caps um, kind of game against an unnamed opposition. It'll probably just end up being like a local club team or something like that. Um, the 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 Gambia game, <laughs> the the Gambia game is the only one that's like the the proper capped game expect to see like something close to a first 11 not a lot of rotation needed when there's only one game you can't rotate anything can you so like first 11 wise with the always expect very similar to what we saw last time um all the sort of talking points in the squad are a little bit deeper in the roster um but having beaten curacao having beaten bahrain i think they'll back themselves to to do quite well against the gambia who have just qualified for the african cup of nations i think for the first time ever or something like that um so they're not a team that's gonna be, have players of the same caliber necessarily I don't like they're obviously on a on a bit of a rise but um we'll see how that goes they all whites should back themselves to win against teams like that though especially if they want to be able to make a world cup um by some point next year whenever the world cup's going to be so do that and so, you know, I think this is the kind of game where they can they can back themselves to do that. And I, I'm optimistic to see, like the Dalai Lama says, I'm choosing optimism. I'm optimistic that I think the All Whites can put in a nice, solid performance, building on what they did last time. And then if they do that, they'll have beaten a team from um, Central America, the Central Northern American Confederation. They'll have beaten a team from the Asian Confederation. Then they'll have beaten a team from an African confederation. They got the Oceania World Cup qualifiers coming up in March. So they'll surely beat at least one team from an Oceania confederation then. Then we just got to sneak in somehow some fixtures between then against um, maybe the lowest ranked European and South American teams we can find. And then we'll have hit for the cycle. That's good. That's a good bring it back to baseball. Yeah. And could have said Aussie over. It's nice. Um, just quickly i'm curious you were talking about football and that sparked tyler boyd in my mind check that he's uh he's floating around different loan situations in turkey did he play yeah, in the well, most you know recent... i said um i said that joey chapman has scored a goal for his turkish team right the game that he scored and he came off the bench it was against tyler boyd's team 
um, Tyler Boyd's current loan team. Not only that, but Tyler Boyd got sent off earlier in that game. Ooh. So the game that Joey Champness scored his goal in, Joey Champness, who was a former Australian youth rep who changed allegiances to New Zealand against Tyler Boyd, a New Zealand youth rep and actually capped at full international level who changed allegiances to America. So one came to New Zealand, one went away from New Zealand. Um, the guy who came to New Zealand scored in this game and the guy who went away from New Zealand got sent off in the game. Oh, that's that's it's almost poetic. Eh? But I was most curious, did he play, when was the last time he played for USA? It, it, like, it oh, only not, has, yeah, not it, recently. Right, it only has his international goals on his Wikipedia. So I was like, it doesn't have like his list of um, caps, but. Yeah, I was curious because you make the big move and then what does it result in? Well, he's been on loan a few times in Turkey and I don't know about USA. Um, you are aware that there is the National Football League in Aotearoa, but obviously Aotearoa right now, we've got a, um, a weird situation where only certain regions of Aotearoa are playing sport because this has uh impacted my blanket shield insights like i've had to hit pause on a few things and just take it slow because you don't have auckland and northern districts uh and i mentioned the rugby league earlier in the show we have had the national premiership and as i said the upper central team won the won the tournament they defeated canterbury so Canterbury losing to Otago and Upper Central is really interesting because Canterbury are, have been a powerhouse, but there is no Auckland or Counties Akarana or Counties team competing. So it's hard to really assess that competition when there is only, well, when there are two teams that usually compete at a high level aren't there. And now we've got a National Football League, which is also rolling out an alternative competition where you're without the Auckland teams and I, I'm not sure how the team representation works there, but you're dealing with less teams. So specifically in the Plunkett Shield, which we're going to talk about, um, I don't haven't like broken down players or, um, you know, taken any major insights away from the New Zealand Rugby League Premiership. Like it's just the, the balance of power stuff was interesting though. But I'm curious, like, you're, you're preparing for the Football League and I'm dealing with it in the Punkish Shield. How does not having the Auckland teams, like how are you viewing these competition, this competition, the National League, and even the Plunkett Shield, because you follow the Plunkett Shield, how are you kind of viewing it knowing that we're dealing, like it's, it's kind of taken away half, like Plunkett Shield's not half, but it's close to. You're taking away two teams. Um, well, it's not even close to this. Like the football one might be closer to half, but you're taking a significant chunk of the competition away. It's still like Canterbury is still dominating in the Plunkett Shield, for example. But I'm just curious, how are you viewing the competition? How does it impact your insights and your like assessments of the competition, knowing that a big chunk of the competition is not participating? Um, yeah, first up, November 20th, 2019 was the last time that Tyler Boyd, it was his 10th and final cap so far to date for the USA, the, the USA M N USA M N T. they have far and too he, many letters. He debuted in 2019 as well. Yeah. Yeah. All those games came with, he debuted in, uh, what's the 6th, June, um, January, February, March, April, May, June, debuted in June, um, played his 10th cap in November. So within the space of five months, he got all his 10 games and hasn't appeared since. He's not been in, as, as you said, he's been pouncing around, like bouncing around loan deals in Turkey. He hasn't fell out of favor at Besiktas. So, um, you know, got to get his club career back on track to get his, you know, USA actually have a lot of players to choose from. So if you're not performing, you, you sort of fall out of the mix. Um, the National Women's League is hard, like you have cut it in half by taking out the Auckland um, and, well, taking out the Northern League teams. So there's three Auckland teams that qualified, plus Hamilton Wanderers also snuck in there as well. So um, that is literally the, the competition has been halved. Um, and the men's one, you've taken out four out of 10. So it's not quite half, but it's almost. So yeah, it's a it's a big chunk. Um, it's, it is a big chunk. And I'm 
I'm not into like the thing is it's been a lot of moving goalposts up till this point. It sort of sounded like at one point they wouldn't play, and then it was like, well, they, we can't play with the Auckland team. Well, they left it as long as they could to give the Auckland teams a chance if the alert levels changed. Um, and then like bloody just, just you sit back waiting, seeing if it, when's the next press release going to update something, and then you get it. Probably not going to go ahead, but we'll try play some games. And then now what they've come up with this is this idea of the um, the South Central League. So just the teams that aren't Auckland or Waikato based are, are just going to play each other for, for the next um, month and a half. You know, there's um, six teams in the men's comp. So they'll play each other once, five games each, and then a final. Um, and then the women's comp, I think there's a final at the end of it, but there's um, four teams there. So everyone plays each other twice. So um, the the women's hadn't gone club based outside of the Auckland Northern teams, so you still have um, the which is why I actually think that the women's competition is a lot more interesting than the men's one um, right now for a couple of reasons because the defending champs will actually get to play Canterbury United Pride will will be there. Um, very different, I think. I, I counted because they had a few, and everyone was sort of boosted because of the timing of the last season because it was sort of like pandemic y times. Um, a lot of university based players who were living in America had come back um, around the pandemic. So you had players who might not otherwise have been there. Um, and a lot of them have left, plus a couple more have gone, like a couple more of the younger ones turning that age have, have moved over there as well. So I think Canterbury actually. I was looking at their squad. I think they've they've um, chucking also a couple of players who have signed with the Phoenix, and they've probably lost. Like they had an incredibly stable starting eleven last year, and they've probably lost about six or seven of those starters. Um, one of the best regions for producing players as well. So it's a, you know there will be others to step up, but it, that makes them re a really interesting team to see. Like who who um, comes in and scores the goals, who does this, who does that, who plays in the midfield, and and all that. Um, so that's quite exciting. They've also like Southern will have an uh, Southern have an interesting team. I think they've lost a couple of very key players, and they might struggle for that reason. But Capital, I haven't seen a squad for Central. I haven't seen a squad for, um, but they're you know they're they're still there. They'll they'll offer what they can. Um, this yeah, the the league looks a bit different. I would imagine. Um, oh, oh, I'd just imagine that like the. Without the Auckland-based teams, it, it takes a lot of the um, takes a lot of the focus on the competition side. Like it's not even going to be a proper competition; it's just this sort of one-off alternative thing. Um, therefore, I think I'm probably a lot more interested. I'm always sort of trying to take a little bit of a um, highlighting players and personalities and things like that, and, and prospects and whatever, and um, or just the like the the battlers who've been around for a little while and giving them their due kind of thing. Um, when I write about these, but I do try to keep like I, I write them under the guise of match recaps generally, and and trying to um, also like keep in keep in mind the the purpose is to try win games and win championships, and that's what players are there to do anyway. But I think maybe it's a little bit more of a player focus this year because of that, because the competition just doesn't really make a lot of sense, and it's a bit of a like sort of scrambled together thing. It's just the best they could do under the circumstances. Um, the men's league is even more of a um, kerfuffle, but maybe the the club thing makes it interesting. I don't know because you, for one thing, you still have um, the Wellington Phoenix and the um, and Western Suburbs, aka the Ole Academy. So you've still got those two like best the the two top um, player pipelines in the country still have their own personal clubs that will be playing, and that'll be super interesting to watch just to see the players who are coming through and all that. Especially like I mean, both of those both of those um, academies because of. The players who have come through in the last few years and then those players have gone on to other clubs that in a similar way to what i was saying about canary and the women's thing that leaves spots for others to come through who are the next wave of players um just finishing up writing an article about the wellington phoenix and the amount of academy players and homegrown players that they have in their squad right now um you know george Ott, curtis mogg ben old alex paulson all key players for them last season um they're off to they're in Australia with the first team. Someone else has got to step up and need a new captain, need other players to fill these spots, you know. Um, and then who are, who are the other two teams? Um, the other 
four teams. You got um, obviously Miramar Rangers and Wellington Olympic. Wellington Olympic won the Central League. Those are the two teams that the defending champs team Wellington is basically built from. Like half their squad goes to Miramar in the winter, half their squad goes to um, Olympic in the winter. Team Wellington doesn't exist anymore. So this is just what it is. Like the top team has been cut in half. Um, and that makes things pretty interesting actually to see how that goes when you when you split that team in half and then um you know they ran it pretty close with each other for the central league title and then the two south island teams that got through were Kashmir tech who's always the dominant team in canterbury and were fully expected and then selwyn united who were a bit of an outsider team um didn't really like the bunch of results went their way on the last day or real dramatic stuff i wrote about it in the last thing i wrote about um domestic footy like that was kind of crazy, and I expect them to be very much the underdogs in, in, all the, in most of their games, but um, underdog mentality often helps in these kind of things. You never know. Um, so in light of all that, I it's all come upon real quick too because only a few days ago that they announced what they were doing. I, I wasn't expecting it to start necessarily so quickly, and it'll be over by mid-December. So um, it's a... Like I'm still scrambling to try to try to figure out the context of what I'm supposed to be thinking about it. But yeah, you know, I'll watch the games, see how things go, write about them, try highlight some key players, um, and you know, just try do my team of the week type things and whatever whatever I've been doing for these things. But like same time, it's it's not it's not quite the same, and it is going to definitely be a little bit odd just without the. Um, you know, without teams like Auckland City or whatever um, being a part of it, it does it does sort of change the, um, I don't know, just the uh, the not severity, but the whatever the thing is, it, it just doesn't make the league quite as serious as it otherwise would be. But I mean that that'll come with its own things. Maybe we'll see a bit more rotation, see other players given a go. Um, just fun to watch a bit of domestic football. We'll see how it goes. It's fun to watch a bit of domestic cricket as well. And it's if there wasn't this one thing happening in the Plunkett Shield, I I would be in a it would just be a weird kind of tournament. You'd have to I'd just have to wait longer. You know, you'd have to wait till the end of this the first stanza to really um suss out like who's been doing what over a consistent period consistent period of time. Um, just because it's four teams basically cruising around the South and Wellington and Central Districts cruising around there playing each other. But there is this one thing happening, and that is Canterbury just being Canterbury again. And they've started, like, Tom Latham has scored two centuries to start the the, um, season. The only other dude who has done that is Greg Hay floating on the cricket bat behind my head. And Greg Hay is just fantastic, but Tom Latham is the Black Caps test opener. And he was one of the best batsmen in Bangladesh in T20 cricket. And he's back in Aotearoa in the Plunkett Shield, back-to-back centuries, which is a bit ridiculous. Henry Nichols is averaging over 50. Cameron Fletcher is top 10 for runs again. He was top 10 last year in a full Plunkett Shield. And... It's been a slower start for Tom Blundell. Dane Cleaver's been solid. So obviously Blundell's the Black Caps test wicketkeeper. But Cameron Fletcher's doing it. He's scoring a lot of runs in Plunkett Shield cricket as well. And that's just the introductory point into the New Zealand wicketkeeper. Um, yarn, that is always pretty interesting because they're all pretty good. But the main thing for Canterbury is how good their seamers are. Matt Henry, fantastic as always. Will Williams and Fraser Sheet are top five for the second Plunkett Shield in a row. And they both, through their careers, they're averaging 22 and 23. And then um, Henry Shipley took six wickets against Wellington as well. And he is just a bit shorter than Kyle Jamison. And he, his like deliveries are that... Like, he just kind of, there was one, I think he got Luke Georgeson out, and it's just a good length, but because he's so tall, it's like a real heavy um, length. The same thing you see Kyle Jamison, like, they, the, the ball just bounces different, off, off different lengths when you're coming from that height. Um, and Shipley, in 2016, he was a, he was a meter 96. 
So one would imagine he's grown maybe a centimeter or two since then. Kyle Jamison is 2.03. So he's a bit taller, but Shipley's not too too much shorter. Um, and he also scored a 50 with the bat. And Henry Shipley is interesting because he has talent, but all his stats suggest he hasn't really done anything since his debut in 2016. And here he is taking, I think he took six wickets in the match. And yeah, three wickets and three wickets. And he scored a 50. So he's clearly quite talented. Um, and then there was a big old run fest with Central Districts and Otago Nick Kelly. He was really here. I think he was top five for Plunkett Shield runs last summer. And he scored a double century to start this summer. Um, Greg Hay, another century. Hamish Rutherford, I think, had a century. And he's started with a century and a half century. So these are the players who have hit two half centuries or better so far. You've got Tom Bruce, 250s. Cameron Fletcher, century, half century. Hamish Rutherford, century, half century. Um, Dane Cleaver's hit a century. So he's got more runs than Cameron Fletcher, but he didn't hit a half century. Nick Kelly, Nick Kelly hit a double century. So it's kind of like a... Two centuries in one, yeah. yeah. Two for the price of one. Then Tom Latham and Greg Hay have two centuries. So um, those are kind of the best batsmen. And I'm curious, Wildcard will we'll have to move pretty quickly through this, but we will get some quick black caps notes at the end, but I am curious, what are your a couple of talking points maybe for you and the Plunkett Shield to start the season? Two games, only four teams playing. Canterbury have won a game and drawn a game, and they are leading the competition. Yeah, they're, they do look like the most consistent team that um, carrying on from last season, it was just maybe a little bit of a step above, especially while they've got... Um, especially while they've got Latham and, and Nichols around. Because um, for obvious run scoring reasons, I think maybe they, maybe if those guys weren't there, they might be a little bit more vulnerable um, with the bat, but they're, they're going to take wickets regardless with the amount of options that they have there. I, I was thinking watching um, some of these games about like, where do you actually like supposing that they are able to get the Auckland, um, you know, Auckland and Northern districts back in it? Like, where do you actually fit those games in? And I was thinking, well, I guess you just have to carry the season on later. Um, because you're not going to move the whole Super Smash back if you can. Like, I, I just guess that, um, you know, March, April, they'll still be playing Plunkett Shield or whatever. Um, in which case, you know, how the Plunkett Shield tends to go is early doors, it's um. It's going to be nice and damp on those wickets. You're going to, it's going to be green. You're going to get a bit of seam movement. You're going to get a little bit of swing there going as well. It's going to be fun for the seam bowlers. Um, by the end of the season, generally run scoring paradise. <laughs> Everything's dried out over summer, um, particularly the last year or two when there have been water shortages as well, which probably haven't out some of the wickets. But, I mean, we just saw an absolute, like you said, the run fest that um, – that Otago and uh, CD game, wouldn't it? Would like that's that's an end of season scorecard you're supposed to be looking at there, and we got that in the second round. So that's and a you bit, got it in Dunedin, a funky one in Dunedin too. Yeah, it's what were they playing on an artificial or something? What's going on there? Um, it might be dry down there. It might have been lots of sun over the last few weeks well to dry it out because it is quite a dry, you know, southern Otago areas can be dry. Um, yeah, it can be or the bowling. Just isn't quite. I just like I little column A, little column B, probably. Like because I looked at you know you're watching CD score a shitload of runs and you're like Jacob Duffy's taking wickets, but I don't necessarily um, like on because Muller took five or six wickets or something good in round one. Yeah, and like yeah, it's just trying to piece it all together. It's like if I'm looking at the Otago lineup, I'm looking at like there's one really good seamer and then there's not necessarily the constant threat that you might otherwise get with Canterbury. Um, Central Districts had Bracewell and Tickner and Otago were scoring runs for fun. Yeah. 
But then I don't think any team has a bowling attack like Canterbury where it's like Matt Henry's going to open the bowling and he's going to be fucking at you all the time. And then Will Williams and Fraser Sheet are doing what they're doing for a reason. Like neither looks to be bowling fast. Fraser Sheet looks a bit faster than Will Williams. Fletcher often stands up to Will Williams. Um, but they take wickets for fucking fun. Like they just churn through batting lineups. I think Will Williams has taken at least two wickets in his in the first innings of his last six games. There's like four of those games he took no second innings wickets, so it's a factor. But it's just like guarantee two wickets, two wickets, three wickets, three wickets, two wickets. Um, and and Fraser Sheet, he just he just bagged a five foot in this game. He got like uh, Rachin Ravindra, Tom Blundell, Finn Allen, um, and he looks really good. So it's kind of just like, and then Henry Shipley comes in or Ed Nuttall comes in. Uh, last season was often Sean Davey as well. And I think, I don't think the other three teams have a bowling attack that is as consistent and as deep as Canterbury's. Because you've also got Theo Van Werkham, who's a handy spinner. Cole McConchie, he's a handy spinner. These are good spinners who are going to bowl dot balls with a really strong seam attack. Wellington's a bit, um, Ben Sears is good, or well, has like, but he's not like, still got to land the ball in good areas, but he's always pretty quick and he's a high yeah. profile seamer. He's inconsistent, but he's threatening, yeah. Threatening. And then it's kind of like really good domestic seamers, you know, the Ian McPeaks. Um, mm -hmm. I don't think Ollie Newton played, but it's, you don't necessarily have, well, you definitely don't have Matt Henry in your bowling attack let alone three or four other seamers who are fantastic as well. And I just think, and that's the weird thing about CD, you'd be hoping Doug Bracewell and Blair Tickner would be pushing and um, doing some things. So maybe that pitch down in Dunedin wasn't very helpful. Um, but as far as bowling attack goes, I don't think any bowling attack compares to Canterbury's right now. And then you've also got Latham, Nichols, um, those characters. Yeah, yeah. It's their their eleven is just better than anyone else's. It's like it's just it, it's stacked and it's stacked in the right kind of ways to win Plunkett Shield games as well. So, um, good for them. It's what we saw from them last season. It's what we're seeing from them this season. I, I don't think in that case it really matters that they don't have the Auckland R and D stuff to to go against. But it, I, I do hope they can get. I mean, obviously everyone hopes they can get that going at some point. But, um. It is it, like right now. It sort of feels like they get they're just getting the games in that they can get in. Obviously, but it will start to be a bit of a problem if it gets to the point where they start feeling like they can't fit everything in, and then it then it all gets a bit weird. Um, then you get to the territory where I was just talking about with the with the football stuff, where it's like these are good performances. This is interesting to see, but it's a bit harder to to understand the full context when you take out like. For example, the most populous region of the country, um, just out of the mix entirely, it, it gets sort of feels like half a competition. But um, right now, the Plunkett Shield is just you know, it, it's doing what it it's doing what it can, and it's, it's you know, serving up good cricket, and it's been fun to watch. That that's exactly why I find the Canterbury stuff interesting because it's kind of foolproof. Yeah, yeah, like, exactly. It's, yeah, it's a continuation because they won everything last summer, and. Latham and Nichols are doing exactly the same thing. There's no Daryl Mitchell who was dominant, like dominant in the Plunkett Shield in all formats in New Zealand last summer. He's taken away, but everyone else just cruises along at the same level. Um, and I, yeah, that doubling down from Canterbury, I think, still is worthy of um, worthy a note, even though it is a weakened competition. You know, overall, statistically gauging the stats overall. Um, Black Caps defeated Scotland. They play Namibia. Quick turnaround. Anything to take us over to the um, Namibia game wildcard? I'm kind of, I've got a very, well, I've got a concrete idea of what I might write about tomorrow, but it was probably best after the Namibia game about the Seamers, Trent Bolt, Tim Salvi, because they are, just as important as East Sodium Mitchell Santa, I believe. And Trent Bolt's just taken six wickets, fucking one of the best bowlers in the World Cup so far. And I don't think they're necessarily being viewed 
in that way because Sodi was the star against India, fantastic performance, um, and it's all about spin bowling. Like Everyone's worried about spin bowling, where I think seam bowling is far more prominent at this World Cup than many people are making it out to be. That's kind of what I'm thinking about with this team. Obviously, Guppy went large against Scotland. Glenn Phillips had a knock as well. What from that Scotland game in when packaged with what might happen against Namibia are you thinking about with the Black Caps? Well, I think Scotland and Namibia are two similar level oppositions. Namibia did beat Scotland when they played each other. Um, and I think they're both games that the Black Caps... I, don't, I wouldn't even say they're banana peel games. I think they're just games that the Black Caps will be able to win if they go out there and put in even an 80% performance. It's kind of what we got against Scotland. They, um, they, they were far from their best. I think the pitch was a little slower than they anticipated, and there were a lot of mistimed shots at the top. Um, all the way through, in fact. Like Glenn Phillips faced about 30-odd balls and, and struggled to get hardly anything really away, and that's just not what you expect from Glenn Phillips. He... Um, did have a habit of playing like he's he scored some wonderful ones in that game like in that innings he he had a lot of clean shots straight to boundary fielders where you get through for one he also because of that was because and him and Gupsal are very quick too running a lot of twos um and Martin Gupsal absolutely paid the price for that by the end of it because he'd been batting for the whole thing and he was like gasping for breath in between they, it, they'd run two and then he'd stop and like take his helmet off and he'd just look like death like personified like his, his, his eyes were gone he was like glazed over and he's looking like he was just going to keel over and vomit on um over like off stump or something but um he battled through like an absolute champion all the while he was like um struggling for breath you could see he was like all flushed and he was um every now and then it'll be like can i just get a change of gloves and like buy some time and whatever just to just to ease up and amidst all that he's just smacking sixes all over the park um it's like in pure strength sixes too because like i say it was a bit hard to time the ball um on that wicket especially with like some of those scotland bowlers are tricky bastards they got that guy um uh watts who's a left arm um orthodox he doesn't really spin the ball. He doesn't spin the ball because he doesn't pitch it half the time. He's just bowling Yorkers. Um, and he's bowling Yorkers like um, darting them in at 100 plus Ks an hour. He's um, bowling from sometimes like um, right on the edge of the pitch. Sometimes he's bowling from behind the umpire. Uh, like he's just mixing up where he's bowling, like where he's delivering it from. It's to a point where I'm like, I don't even know if this helps. What's the point of bowling two meters behind the crease like you're just messing with your own line at that point i don't know but um he bowled real well they had a they had a um fellow sharif at the top who was bowling nice full lengths and um, making it a bit tricky for the guys to get away with just a little bit of um seam but having said that like they were the commentators were talking midway through like the black caps were in big trouble um they were 50 odd for three scoring at about eight and over or something. They were and like Phillips and Guptill were in. And they obviously went on and had a big partnership after that. It wasn't really, they, they really weren't in that much trouble. It's just that they, like, you know, Williamson got out cheaply, dangling one down leg side um, and caught behind um, Conway gloved one, trying to reverse sweep early in his innings, like two, Guys got out cheap like that. Uh, Mitchell got an awkward one in LBW that looked like it was going on at the top, given out after about 15 seconds of deliberation from the umpire. And then the review showed it was clipping the top umpire's call. So, you know, that could have obviously gone either way. Um, but that's how you can lose three quick wickets sometimes. They just had to be like, well, we're not going to score 220 here. Then we just got to settle for like 160 or something. But they got a good partnership. Guptill got a bunch of sixes away and that turned into 180 odd. Um, and then they did enough with the ball. Like they weren't classy um scotland had two or three guys sprinkled through their lineup who just timed the ball nicely and were hitting boundaries um and maybe the black caps got a little bit not complacent but just a step below complacent with some of that um because it wasn't like scotland were ever in a position where you're like well they might chase these runs down um they were always behind the ball just like they hung around longer than they should have they didn't wrap them up with a few extra wickets but you know, it's a, it's a 2020 World Cup. You take the wins how you get them as long as you as long as you get that W. And the Black Caps throughout that game, I thought, were um, not as comfortable as they should have been, but as close to comfortable as they were going to get. Like, as, as close to comfortable as they needed to be, rather. And I think in the context of a tournament, they would want this game, or I would want this game for the team. Because you can, I think you could have gone through this and been like, yeah, 
Scotland and Namibia, no challenge, nothing goes wrong. And then you've got a super niggly contest against Afghanistan. Mm. Instead, what happened is this was a niggly contest in itself. Like guys were dismissed in awkward ways. Things fell against them. Conditions were pretty shit for what they were doing. And there was a, it wasn't a destructive. First day game as well. That um, first was definitely game. a factor in Guptill's exhaustion. Yep. And not every, it wasn't a destructive bowling performance, yep. you know? So they had to still play at a high level to win the game. And I think, I, I reckon they want the same thing against Namibia, just so they're battle hardened type of stuff for the Afghanistan contest. And hopefully they survive physically. Um, I did yeah. say uh, in a previous, it might've been the, the Monday Patreon podcast, Gaptal, Mitchell, Williamson, Conway, top four batsmen. If you want, we need them to score a hundred runs. That's what they did. Guptal got most of them, but yeah. Guptal got 93, Mitchell got 13, but the, you want the idea to be present for every game and how you get there, who gives a shit? Yeah. So last time it was like Mitchell scored a lot of the runs and then there was like a 20 from Guptal and a, something from Williamson. Cool. 100 runs, that's the package we're looking for. This time around, it was Guptal. It was just him by himself and Williamson and Conway contributed one run. And I think however you get it, top four batsmen, score 100 runs, and then we're dealing in beautiful Jimmy Neesham innings, 10 off six deliveries, all we need, all we want, no yeah. dramas. They, they sort of needed at the point where Guptill was no longer able to physically move other than to swing massive sixes, um, and Phillips just mistiming the ball for ones or beautifully timing the ball for ones or mistiming it for twos. Um, but not hitting fours and sixes. Like it's, they sort of needed someone to get out like three overs earlier and give Jimmy Nisham some more room. Um, the death overs are a problem for the Black Caps. Um, and these stats add up to um, like add, add on to that thing um, from this game. However, this is, it was not the same as the Pakistan game where the death overs were the deciding factor. This was like death overs didn't matter. The Black Caps had enough runs. They didn't score, they didn't pile them on at the end like they should have. Um, but they still got a good score. Um, they certainly let Scotland get a lot closer than they should have at the end with their bowling, um, Black Caps' bowling stuff. Um, but they weren't close enough to where they were threatening the win at that point. Um, would have had to go a, a few extra big ones to get there. Uh, so, like, it, it adds up to where Scotland probably, like if you isolate those last four hours of each inning, Scotland probably looked like they did a lot better, but the circumstance of the overall game was different. Whereas in the Pakistan game, those four overs at the end of each innings ended up being decisive. Here it was just sort of like sloppy. Um, I did see a stat from like Crickviz or something like that, trying to claim that the Black Caps don't have a big hitting closer because um, just like looking at the numbers they put up in these, and I'm like... Jimmy Nisham has a like a international strike rate of 156 or something ridiculous, um, like an obscene strike rate. That if that's not a big hitting late innings guy, then I don't know what is. So I think there's a little bit of selective thinking there that sort of plays into the idea of what I was saying. Like the the death overs here against Scotland, not the same as the death overs against Pakistan. However, they could be a problem against Afghanistan. Um, that's that's an that's an issue that this team probably has to deal with. It death bowling hasn't been good enough, and so far we haven't quite seen them hit blast off in the last sort of five, four, five overs um, with the bat either. But you know, if they, they're getting there, they, they scored enough, more than enough runs in this game, so I don't think it's such a problem. To me, that one. <laughs> to me it speaks to the specific challenge that is the T Twenty World Cup as opposed to yeah, what yeah, happens in the IPL. Like this is a T20 World Cup where opposition teams are well-equipped or well-drilled in their plans at the death. They are probably better prepared. And it's also conditions that I don't think is incredibly easy to bat. And if it's not easy to bat throughout the innings, it's certainly not going to be easy to slog from ball one later on in the innings 
when you're trying to get into the game, but the bowler has already bowled three overs, they know what the pitch is doing. They know what they're trying to do with their skill set, with their slower balls, whatever. And they're, they're rolling through every one of their crafty scenarios on pitches that adorn a bit. I think to view it in a normal 2020 lens is, um, I think it's a bit of a, an illusion in this context because it's just about who wins. Yep. And it's not necessarily about like, I, I think, yeah, I think the, um, because you just want to get 170 runs. It's not about how you do it necessarily. Same thing with the, the principal top four batsmen score 100 runs. It's not about where you get them in the start or at the end. You just want to put up a massive total and fucking destroy the other team. That's all you're trying to do. You know, it's not. Um, uh, and Jimmy Neesham had a strike rate of 166 in this game. Yeah, 10 off six or something like that. Yeah. Which is useful. It's handy. It's what yeah, you want. Yeah, it is. It is useful. Um, so yeah, no, that's that's a weird one. You can't just. Uh... It's like, um, like if 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 this New Zealand team played against the Scotland team in a Test match environment, like or first class game or something like that, you know, two innings, red ball, um, multiple days, they'd crush them, like they'd destroy them. Um, but twenty twenty format shrinks the um, shrinks the gap and and like a team like Scotland has played a lot of 2020 cricket and they have some very good um and then like close competitive games against other associate nations too um plus they're getting like and they you know they had that before the black cap like they had the pre-super 12 stages as well so they were getting games in there so they're a little more match ready um and 2020s like like I say the, the difference is a little bit less um, there are guys in the Scotland team um, like old mate Watt with the ball know exactly what their game are. will play to a simple plan, but a plan that'll work nicely for them. Um, and yeah, ultimately all I really have to, all, all, all else I really have to say on the matter is, you know, just get the win. Like that's what the Black Caps did. Just get the win. And that's cool. Now I think about it a bit longer. I think it's actually quintessential Black Caps. Because the Black in Caps... Way? Because they get they get super present. This is the game. This is the challenge. This is what we need to do in the moment. They focus all their energy on that. They learn from it and they move forward to the next game. And these are things we've talked about for um, plenty in re in Black Caps podcasts. And the Black Caps aren't the team who are going to whip you in a frenzy in the first two games. They are the team that builds into the tournament. You're not looking at the black, like maybe that ODI World Cup, you weren't necessarily thinking about the Black Caps as a great team to win the World Cup after the first game or the second game. Oh, you've probably got a better memory than me as to how that World Cup played out. But they kind of, you know, during the semi final, during the final, during like those later yeah. games, they, yeah, they weren't... peaked at the end. Yeah, they built towards it. Well, they it. weren't like, they were in tricky spots there as well. They just kind of deal with what's in front of them as opposed to now nah, we're here to dominate the first three games. We're going to show all our cards. We're going to show you that we've, you know, got the best hitters, got the best sluggers, blah, blah, blah. The black caps just kind of go about their work. It's, it's a bit played out, you know, the quiet Kiwi, the quiet black caps, the un like, under the radar. I think that's just because they focus solely on the challenge that is Scotland, niggly pitch, niggly opponent, get the job done. And it's not about like, how polished it was or, you know, those type of ideas. Same thing against Namibia, who you said defeated Scotland. They also have extensive knowledge. They've played on these pitches for, you know, more games, twice as many games as New Zealand. And they've been there. They're used to conditions. It's going to be another little niggly challenge, I reckon. And we'll see how it plays out tomorrow night. Yeah, well, it, it will be. Short turnaround and two similarly matched teams. Um, well, it's between Scotland and Namibia, I mean, to like two similar caliber of opponents. Um, be fun. And because, yeah, the, the way it's setting up is the Black Caps are going to need to beat Afghanistan um, in that last game. And that's, yeah, <laughs> you need to be in the best place possible coming into that one because that, that is definitely a banana peel game. That's a tricky one. But um, get to... Get to, get to that point and 
address that when we when we get there. However, that we'll cross that bridge when we come to it is the is the point. And yeah, sweet as. Is that game Saturday night, Sunday night? Um, which one? The Namibia game. Oh, Namibia uh, is on Friday night. The Afghanistan, I think, is Sunday night. Um, I can tell yes, you, it is. Correct. Yeah, Sunday night. Both eleven p.m. kickoff, kickoffs, um, beginnings, whatever. Yeah. First deliveries. First deliveries. The bat off. So, <laughs> we uh we had, we had a kickoff for the show in the center circle of the football pitch, and this is the end. The final whistle. It's the last over. delivery. You're Around standing like get that by to the keeper. Have you ever been like on a sports field and the ref bolt blow is standing right beside you and they blow their whistle? Uh no. Because oh, fucking terrible. my main experience of that, I normally play up front or out wide, so I'm I'm spread out from the ref in the middle. So yeah, they stand right next to you, and they like, especially if it's a hard whistle, and you're like, you've got no idea that they're even there. They blow their whistle, and you're like, fuck, bro, like, Jesus, chill out, like. It's not a weapon. It's just a fucking whistle, you know? So it goes. Oh, I'll try hang around the middle and experience that at some point next season. Probably don't want to, actually. Yeah, it's not worth it. Don't worry. No, it's, it's, it's probably it not. Sucks. It's not yeah, even no. kind of, yeah. Farewell. Podcast finished. Stay beautiful. Spread the positive vibes. Exchange the energy. And love yourself. Kia kaha. Church it.